You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. From Mamma Mia, I'm Claire Murphy. Welcome to No Filter. Don't worry about me, daddy. I've just got to make you see. It was in 1989 that us Aussies first saw and fell in love with Effie Stefanides, with her big, big hair, chunky jewellery and skin-tight dresses. She was a very different-looking TV star from the sea of blonde-haired, blue-eyed beauties that we were used to at the time. Listen, cousin, Saif and me need a job so we can keep up with expenses, eh, Saif? Yeah, hair gel. Yeah, and heaps and heaps of makeups. Anyway, I want to be more independent. You independent since when? Since I moved out of home. Hey, you moved out of home? Where do you live now? In the bungalow. (laughs) In the backyard. In fact, typical Australia looked very different to the TV landscape, with Effie alongside her other Greek-Australian co-stars on the hit comedy show Acropolis Now, showing us from the relative safety of our lounge rooms just how multicultural Aussie neighbourhoods could be. Effie was embraced across cultural divides, including Greek Australians who could see the truth behind her jokes. Her hilarious phrases were repeated everywhere by kids and adults alike. How embarrassment. Hello, Liz. Hello, Effie. Good, thanks. (laughs) Beauty. It's a curse. (laughs) And I've got it. Her popularity would see her go on to appear on a stack of other shows and stages and even won her creator Mary Kustis a gold Logie. But now, more than 30 years later, Mary's latest project is her most raw and vulnerable yet. It's a one-hour solo stage show called This Is Personal. In this show, Mary opens up about everything from being a child of Greek migrants to the pain of losing her dad and the highs and lows of being a late-in-life mother bringing that same effy honesty to the conversation. My dad was dying before I was born, so he'd already had a massive heart attack that should have killed him. The year before I was born, you know, we spent a lifetime trying to evolve beyond the things we inherit, the things that traumatise us. And yet here I am standing in my father's shoes watching history repeat. Here's Aussie icon and legend, Mary Kustis. I just wanted to start off today by saying that if tween me knew that I would one day sit down with Mary Kustis. Oh my gosh, I would not have believed it for starters. Maybe you do understand, but do you have any idea about the generation of people like myself? So I would have been, I think, 11 or 12 when Acropolis Now started on TV. And my parents are British migrants, so very different experience of life in Australia than your families. And For my parents, I didn't quite understand the content of Acropolis Now. It was just a funny, stereotypical representation of what Greek migrants were, right? (laughs) What? V-O-5, huh? Effie and Sophie's favourite hairspray. Mate, this nose can pick them coming from a mile away. Yeah, that nose can pick them coming from Greece. (laughs) And so we watched this as young people and absorbed it and we used those phrases in the schoolyard. It's been so impactful on my life and the lives of people, my contemporaries, because it made our understanding of migrants outside of our own experiences so much clearer, even if it wasn't a comedic way. Do you have like a concept of how impactful Acropolis now has been on generations of other migrants in Australia? I do, because people like you, Claire, come and tell me. You know, and I see it in the faces, even if I'm stopped at the lights and I look over and I see someone who looks at me and then clocks who I am and what I've done and their expression of, you know, joy and gratitude, you know, and I try not to overly think that stuff. I uh, spend a lot of time selectively choosing what I'm going to focus on because I just want to get a lot of great things done in this lifetime. And whether that means personally or professionally. So I had just had coffee with someone who I knew from the very beginning at Channel 7 when we did Acropolis Now. And she came and saw my show on the weekend and and she said, you haven't changed at all. And I said, I could think of nothing worse than to spend energy on power or trying to control the environment or whether someone could approach me or couldn't. I don't want to focus on things that don't serve 
you know, the greater good. And by that, I don't mean the world at large. I mean my world. It doesn't help me create things that I think matter to me and luckily to many others like me, of which there are so many. If I'm stopping and looking at all these things that don't matter, I love that people feel moved by what I've done and liberated and the boys and I definitely did that at the beginning to do that for ourselves and we realised very quickly. I like to say that there are enough minorities to make the majority and so as women I like to be reminded of that because we do make so many of the choices that uh, have to be made in life. And we do outlive men, generally speaking, by 5 to 7%. So I want to take the power without uh, letting that powerful stuff that fans the ego get in the way of creating more powerful stuff. Do people still throw f at you mm. when they recognise you? Totally. I love it. People always say, hello, good thanks, or how embarrassment, or beauty, it's a curse. Beauty, it's a curse. <laughs> and I've got it. <laughs> Actually, a girl was telling me that her dad says beauty, it's a curse, and I've got it every day. And that's their little sort of joyful little comical pill that they ingest and spew out to each other every day. And I love that. Language should be playful. I often wonder what our teachers would have thought with all us little 12-year-olds walking around going, oh, hello, like to each other yeah. in the schoolyard yeah. <laughs> all those years ago. But that experience for a lot of people was their first kind of exposure to migrants from other countries because, and I don't know what it was like in Melbourne back then, but I grew up in Adelaide and so all the British migrants tended to stay in the southern areas of Mm. Adelaide and then the western suburbs where all the Italian and Greek migrants settled. So there wasn't a lot of interaction between them unless it was in business. Yeah. So was it like that in Melbourne when you were growing up and did it change after you were in Acropolis now and and it was so much more exposed to a wider audience. Was that well received by people outside of your inner circles? Well, my childhood, like many, comes in sort of segments. So primary school until I was nine, I lived in a very multicultural working class suburb, Collingwood, which was a melting pot of every culture, including Anglo-Saxon. And we lived happily. And it was a level playing field and none of us had a lot of money, but we were really curious about each other. And that I thought was the world until I then got moved with my family. My dad wanted to invest in a greater future for us and knew that my options would be limited and so would my brothers if we'd stayed in Collingwood. So then we went to the middle class and, and it was the white middle class. There was no one. There were two kids at the school and the other one didn't even, she was blonde and fair, the other Greek girl. So, you know, I became the target for a lot of the bullying and they were not welcoming to a new flavour. And I say in the show, I might as well have been painted in neon and dipped in garlic because I stood out. There was nothing I could do. I couldn't change my name. That wouldn't matter. My face was my face and there were clues that I was different. I didn't realise that that was a problem, but it became one. And so that's informed my work from then on, I think. And I think if you're lucky enough to find a creative outlet, you find ways of turning, you know, trauma into something that's more positive and that's something that helps others. Luckily, comedy was the pill of choice I chose in order to do that. And laughter is the great healer, I think. It sort of distances you just for a moment from something and forces you to observe it and not be, you know, the target of it. So my humour really saved me. And in in the show I say, you know, in life you've got to find the funny because without it you're screwed. That was my drug of choice, was comedy and creativity. And so I think people that have had similar issues come up for them, you know, we're we're all battling with identity and it, it might not be cultural, it might be just physical or it might be some sort of ailment that you have that that makes you different from the majority. We all find comfort in finding something that speaks to us and that empowers us and the work's done that. So I get a lot of grateful fans coming up and thanking me for not only empowering them in some way but their children who have grown up watching the show on DVD. So it's a good feeling. Do people still watch DVDs? Well, they do apparently. <laughs> Speaking of children, and I mean, last time you were on this show, you spoke to Mia Friedman back in 2016 about your journey to parenthood. You once said that you stopped counting your IVFs. Is that really true? Oh, yeah. I mean, you have to. Uh, I think sometimes you just have to stay in the most positive frame of mind possible. And 
for me, I just had to believe that success was in front of me. And if I referred to the amount of failure I'd I'd had in terms of IVF Mm. attempts, I think it would have just robbed me of the will to keep going. And this stage show that you currently have on This Is Personal really focuses on you being a late in life mother. Uh, from one later in life mother to the other, nothing quite so confronting as being called a geriatric pregnancy. But you really focus in on the what now with Jamie, because Jamie's over nine now. And now you're staring down a future with her that might end before her major milestones have been achieved. Do you want to talk to me about how that feels to know that maybe you won't be there for some of the big questions in life for her? Yeah, that's scary. I mean, I inherited that same dilemma with my dad. My dad was dying before I was born. So he'd already had a massive heart attack that should have killed him the year before I was born. So I'm familiar with this territory. I've been the victim or the the child of someone that was worrying about that stuff. And I've become that. And in the show, I say, you know, we spend a lifetime trying to evolve beyond the things we inherit, the things that traumatize us. And yet here I am standing in my father's shoes, watching history repeat. We've all got concerns. Look, I've said this before, being a late in life mother was not the ideal. It was not the objective. It was just the reality. I didn't realize it would take me a decade to become a mother. But there are young parents out there that don't feel equipped either. There are children out there that might not feel wanted in more ideal circumstances on a numerical level than mine. I think in life we have to accept that the ideals don't exist. They're there as a one-dimensional concept. You know, we like to think money solves all problems. Well, it might solve, you know, paying some bills, but does it solve happiness or health or, you know, function versus dysfunction? Do you trust people when you have a lot of money? Do people want to be your friend? Because You know, we we tend to just categorize every other issue other than our own in the simplest ways. And yet when we're dealing with our own issues, we can see the complexity of those. So I see the complexity of being a late in life mother, as you do too. But My daughter feels like she was wanted. She knows that I went literally to the other side of the world to have her. So there is great comfort. There are benefits. I hope to God I live as long as my grandmother, which was 93, or my grandmother's mother, which was 107. So, you know, I'm an optimist, but I'm also a realist. So I try to plant seeds now nice and early on things that I think would serve her long term. I try to make her as independent as possible so that she can take charge. The balance is really trying not to spook them because you don't want to give them concepts that they're too young to understand completely. Yeah, I can imagine there'd be some nightmares of, mummy, are you going to die? (laughs) Like that's not what you want to end up doing, is it? No, no, I don't want her to worry about that. I spent a lifetime worrying about that with my father and, and that led to a lot of anxiety, which, you know, I still carry and I try to monitor and calm myself down because it happened and I survived. And would I have preferred a parent that lived a longer life? Not if I didn't have him. You know, I had gold. I had access to a mint that just kept giving me all this currency. It was a mint with a timer on it, but I wouldn't have swapped him for anyone. And there are people out there, and I hear it from people that come and see my show that say, I have an 85, 89-year-old parent that I have no relationship with, that I go and visit, and there's nothing there, you know. So we've got to look at things and ultimately run with what we have and try to make that work. So I try to make it work as much as I can. I'm energetic, I'm passionate, I'm present, you know, with my daughter, there are great things that that are there. But yeah, I do worry about the long term and I hope it's something I don't have to worry about. What are some of the things that you're trying to make sure she understands now? I say that you need to be independent. Even if you've got lots of money, you need to be independent as a woman because then you can walk when you need to, you know, that you're free to walk away from a bad situation or something that doesn't serve you. I don't want ever, and I've never been this person where a partner gives me a hundred dollars and then I I need money for something else. And they say, but I gave you a hundred. Well, what did you do with that? I don't want to be accountable except for morally (laughs) in life to anyone. And there's other things that'll be keeping you accountable for that. Yeah. (laughs) Hopefully not a partner. I, I just want 
my daughter to go off and find a job that she's passionate about and go into a world where she's with healthy peers and where she can do something that's outside of the domestic. And I don't mean to talk down the domestic. I love you know, being at home and I love doing those things, but I also love accessing a world that's outside of that, that helps me express, interact, gives me a reason to get up and get out of the house. So I want my daughter to have that, even if she doesn't need it, because there are so many benefits in going out into the world every day and being around others that aren't your direct family that lived under your roof. I think that's really healthy. I don't find any positives in isolation. In your show, you talk about your parents quite a bit. And I mean, this is an hour long show, which is just you talking and when I came out the other side of it, I was like, oh my God, was that an hour? Because it's fascinating to watch you recreate these people on stage. You really take on their personas and you really set a scene that I, I think I could recognise these people if I met them through the way that you've portrayed them. And seeing how you speak about your dad and you've just touched on it there about how much of a mint he was, how he was gold, what lessons do you think he's taught you that you've now taken into your parenting? He was the least judgmental person I'd ever met. I mean, even if someone did something like perhaps steal from him or or disappoint him in some way, he would always look into somebody's circumstances and somebody's psychology and understand that that was the, the only choice they felt that they could make and that there would be a price to pay, but they it wouldn't come from him. So he was a big fan of not expecting people to step up to something that's outside of what what's possible at that point. Uh, He had faith in people, but I think the biggest things he said to me that really have panned out in my life and career have been, don't expect anyone to stop living their life to make your dreams come true. That was a big one for me. It sort of forced me to be entrepreneurial and to take charge and never be the victim of whatever was to happen to me. The other one, you know, he always empowered me by telling me how bright I was and that I could think myself out of a situation and that paid off. You know, in times when I was, you know, at uni or as a young actor where I'd been in circumstances where there were heavy drugs or – and there's often a lot of peer group pressure and I'm not saying that I didn't indulge in a couple of things but – I was always very conscious of what was the motivation of the other person wanting to enrol me in something. He forced me to think for myself. And so prior to every situation, I would just have the the privilege of thinking it through for a minute. And that made me make better choices in life. And that's an important thing. So definitely those two things. And he taught me how to be present how to not assume that the next moment was going to be there. And I lived, you know, in my life I've lived with very little regret because I knew that things were finite. So whatever decision I made, I made consciously being aware that that could be the last bit of dialogue or the last moment I had with someone because that's how I grew up. I grew up in that reality. Something I thought was incredibly interesting the way you talk about your parents is the fact that your dad's personality was so big that you didn't see your mother Mm. until long after he'd kind of passed on and you'd grown up a little bit too. I feel this the same with my family too. My dad's personality has been so big, she's been kind of overshadowed by it for a long time. What was the experience like of actually getting to meet your mother as a grown woman and understand who she was and really realise who she was as a person? I think when we're young, we don't see, you know, the bigger picture. And, you know, that that comes with being wise and time and opportunity for somebody else to expose another part of themselves. Um, My dad was so captivating and electrifying that, you know, we're all happily eclipsed by him and he was worthy of that. He was never trying to get that attention. It's just who he was. My mother was the, the sort of person that kept things moving in the house. She was the disciplinarian. She was, I suppose, what I would term typical, which is not what I discovered her to be later after he died. The engine room, right? Yeah. Mm. I think it's really important that we talk about the positives of a negative because that's how the the only way that you can evolve, I think, successfully. My father died. That was the worst thing that could have happened, but there was a positive. And the positive was I discovered my mother who'd been, you know, just functional and cute and fine. She'd been fine and sometimes not fine when, you know, she was more heavy-handed with the disciplined 
But she was under an enormous amount of pressure. I didn't ever really stop to consider the amount of pressure she must have been under. She had two children and a, and a husband that was not in great health. She had no family in Australia to really support her. And she would have been left to parent these two children on her own. And this is not current time. This is, you know, in the 60s and 70s. She had no career. She was a factory worker at times when she was working. I don't know how much fear was living in her mind on a day-to-day level. She certainly didn't show it, but she must have felt it. And then when my dad died, you know, she unapologetically mourned him in such a healthy way that I was envious of it. I was, wasn't was brave enough to to yield to the grief to that degree. She did it and because of that, you know, she was reborn. I would look at her and envy the amount of cleanliness that came through her because she was at peace with how much she, um, you know, missed him and mourned him and came out the other end shiny and new. And I felt like, oh, I'd avoided it when I could successfully because my career literally took off a week after he died. So I had to be professional and I had to be funny and I had to be all these things. But it was a delayed tactic too. And so I think the grieving sort of, you know, took a lot longer for me to deal with. Not that it's ever dealt with, but we know that there's a healthy degree of, oh, yeah, you know, I've gone there boldly. My mother did that. And then she became this cute little, curious, entertaining little figure in our lives. And she became a real asset to us. And she became sort of, you know, she took over his role in a very different way. You know, the philosophy and the never give up and all those things that have influenced me to the same degree that my father's initial stuff did. I saw a lot of strength in her and I got to know her personal story and it was pretty incredible. Uh, you have to watch the show to really understand her personal story because, like, your mum is ballsy, man. Yeah. Like, hectic ballsy. Yeah, totally. <laughs> In a way that I could never have been, I don't think. Like, just throw caution to the wind and get on with your life. Yeah. Like, crazy, crazy ballsy. The other women that feature quite strongly in your story are your chosen family. And I think a lot of people listening to this will resonate with the group of women that you collect over the years who become your people, who you can call on any time of the day or night and they literally will be there with a shovel and a blindfold and be like, what do you need, right? Yeah. Like they're the people that you just adore to the ends of the earth. How important do you think women having a group of female friends is? I saw a little snippet on something with Jane Fonda talking about what, because I'm a big fan of hers, even prior to this new Jane Fonda that we've seen in the last decade or so, but from the very beginning as an actress and as an outspoken person. And she speaks so passionately about her female friendships to the same degree that, you know, you and I would, but publicly. And they're my everything. They're my go-to, go-three. You know, it's where I go to laugh. It's where I go to cry. It's where I go for guidance you know we all help each other in you know even if it's like picking up someone from the airport when they don't need you know someone to pick them up it's just stealing an extra 20 minutes together it's just you know doing the dishes together it's taking a walk together it's they've been there for me and I've been there for them and yeah I'm so blessed I didn't have sisters but I have them in my friendships I didn't have cousins that I was you know able to access but I had them And, you know, Christmas has got pretty dire. After you lose a a family member, you become the family that's lost. And and I understand it. No one wants to get to that information too early on in their lives. You know, it's going to happen to all of us. It happened to me ahead of schedule. My mum, my brother and I were having Christmases. That was super depressing. How was it any different to any other day except that we knew that, you know, what used to be a very joyous occasion was no longer that. And so I started to introduce my chosen family into that. My mum was big hearted enough and bigger picture enough to say, I don't need to see you on Christmas day. I've got the carols to watch. And then I've got all those movies and, and, you know, it's just another day for me. And she set my brother and I free to go off and, and we didn't do it all the time, but we did it enough to know that it was an option for us to introduce all my other friends who didn't want to be with their family or didn't have families that they could be with. And we started having the orphans Christmas and that really changed 
the feeling around those those bigger events that you're supposed to be having as a you know a nuclear family slash extended family for all of us, and that was when the baton got passed from what is tradition to what is a healthy modern choice for us. Yeah, I mean, we've been there for everything together. Even when most of my family, chosen family, have lived on the other side of the world. A lot of my girlfriends lived in America or London and and we would find each other a couple of times a year and we'd somehow be there for all the important stuff. After the break, Mary opens up about the silver lining of her father's passing and, as she puts it, why well, she always liked a sleaze bag. With Acropolis Now, what was it like to be a woman in that era of television? Because you worked with a crew of mostly men, and I'm presuming behind the scenes it would have been mostly men at that time too. What was it like for you to be kind of, I mean, such a star in amongst that as well? Was there ever any jealousy or rivalries that came from that? How did you feel in that situation? No, I think it was designed in such a way where the boys really knew what I was capable of. I'd done Wogs Out of Work on stage for a number of years with them. And I think that if you're coming from a European background, you know how strong women are. You know, you probably got a very strong woman as a mother or as a grandmother. It wasn't really something I had to negotiate. It was, Effie was very spirited, took no rubbish from anyone, didn't really take anything away from anyone either. But if she was tempted to, you know, have an issue with someone on camera, it was playful and it was equally matched. She believed in who she was. She was up herself. She was loving being young. She was loving the 80s. She did everything with a smile, you know, in her eyes. No, I think that they really celebrated the character and me and what I wanted to do and and they were, you know, architects in that. It wasn't an accident. I had an Indigenous woman that I did a job with recently who got up to give a welcome to country and it was one of the most powerful things I've ever heard. She said, actually, I'm not going to do a welcome to country. I'm sure you're Googling everything a million times a day. If you want to know the land that we're on currently. You can just Google that. I'm not going to make it easy for you. And uh, she just took a very different approach. I don't know whether she'd literally thought about it prior to doing that, but she decided to do that. And it was really exciting. And she said, I've got to say that because I was on as Effie, you know, as a corporate job. So I was standing in the audience listening as Effie. And she said, I've got to say that growing up, there was no one on television that I could relate to. Effie was the first Australian feminist I ever encountered. And she reminded me of the elder women in my family. And I just wanted to say that, you know, it's an honour. And it was such a great thrill that that strength was seen by somebody who needed to see it, but also that she called Effie the original feminist that she'd seen on Australian television. It's probably not what you would have said back in the day, right? No, but I see it as that. Hmm. Because if a feminist is someone that is uh, bold enough to dare to say what they think and feel like they have, you know, space on a set amongst boys or in a world amongst men, then, yeah. She also didn't take away anything from her own femininity. You know, she she celebrated all her curves and her beauty and all those sorts of things. And the hairs, all of them. (laughs) Um, So I think that's, you know, really important because I don't think one needs to come at the cost of another. You know, you can be all things as long as it's something that makes sense to who you are and as long as you're not taking away from anyone else. She didn't take anything away. Do you think it helped that the boys you were working with also come from European migrant families who probably also had lots of very strong women in them? Totally. I think that that was really exciting and, and natural for them They were being their alpha selves and I was, you know, being a strong, you know, although I was playing comedy. So I don't know whether I I thought about it other than I'd seen it and I knew it to be true. And I think if you think about comedy and what does it take to be funny or in some way elevating the truth of being human, whether it's slipping over on a banana skin or saying something that makes complete sense to you, although it might be seen as outrageous according to somebody else who would have thought about what they said. I think that, you know, comedy tends to be an exclamation mark to what it means to be human. And what it meant in the 80s and 90s for girls like me, if I hadn't gone to the white middle class, I would have been Effie and I would have happily have been Effie. And I think that's why I've happily done her for so many years and why I've done my best work in the last 10 is because I see the value of it, I see the power of it, and I see the need for it. 
So, yeah, it was a, it was a good time. I was really glad to see that she got the opportunity to come and see your new show. Yeah. But there are some mentions of people who were very attracted to Effie back in the day who decided that Effie was everything they were looking for in a woman. Did she attract wanted slash unwanted attention from men in that time at the peak of her success? As opposed to now, I am a big fan of a sleaze bag. You know, like <laughs> now sleaze bags lost their power and they don't even have a position anymore. They but, do not. <laughs> uh, I don't mind someone having the guts to come on, over and crack on, you know. And, and I say sleaze bag, and I'm not talking about the dark side of people taking that too far. I'm just talking about in a social situation where a man has the confidence to approach a woman and to try crack on. In Maybe a way. in a slightly un PC way well, at times, right? Is it? You know, I don't know. <laughs> I think anyone just that sort of says, How about a drink? or My God, you're gorgeous. I like a little bit of that sport. I mean, Greece is still playing that sport every <laughs> single day, happily, unself consciously. And I think women want to be thought of as, as attractive. You know, the effort we put in to present ourselves in an attractive way, not only to men, but to ourselves and to our girlfriends. We want to, you know, go out there and put our best foot forward. So there was a lot of that and I enjoyed all of it. You know, there was nothing I couldn't handle. They're just words, even if they were clumsy. They were well-meaning or hopefully said with a way to get a good result that, you know, would have been fun for them, maybe not for Effie. And I can handle that. I mean, I improvise half of my stage shows I do as Effie and I invite people to communicate with the character in a way that they hadn't thought of. So I'm a big fan of knowing what I'm dealing with and also for people feeling empowered enough to try chase what they like. And if that means a little bit of sleazy dialogue, I'm, I'm cool with that. Did Effie ever take any of these advances any further? No. She was a good girl. She was a virgin <laughs> until she got married. She might have had a – I like to think she gave half a hand job once and didn't want to finish <laughs> off, but but that's as far as she went. You know, Effie was never going to do anything she didn't want to do or didn't serve her. Mm-hmm. So there was none of that charitable sex stuff that some of us did in order to tick the I've had sex box that was, you know, grossly disappointing You know, uh, it's interesting now people with all these podcasts are revealing what their sexual history was. And there's a lot of women that have not reached the peak, that haven't climbed Everest, so to speak, (laughs) physically. And, you know, that's shocking to me. One of the things I say to my daughter, you know, in the future, uh, in the stage show is sex isn't charity. If you're not getting off, get off. (laughs) Uh, Very good advice. Yeah. I I learned very early on when I was first starting to be, you know, sexual, that surely every Magnum commercial I've ever watched wasn't about this moment. It was uh, seriously anticlimactic. And we know that there's a climax that we were trying to get to, and I didn't get to it. And I made a decision very quickly that I wasn't going to have sex unless I was completely turned on by somebody. And that was a really healthy choice. As you know from having seen the Sage Show, my mother's take on on sex is very different to mine. <laughs> Although she does say, you know, at one point, Mia, if you don't feel like it at the, the beginning, sometimes it's not so bad <laughs> at the end. Um, also not bad advice. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. They're funny things. Effie, you know, did play hard to get to the point where she couldn't be get. You know, she she got from um, picky to desperate overnight. So I think that there is a point where you think, <laughs> well, maybe all this, you know, interested stuff from um, people that are famous and bold enough to crack onto Effie, maybe that's going to stop at some point. And it did. And then suddenly she was looking for love and, and going trolling through her past going, I didn't really give anyone a chance and maybe I was too up myself and maybe I've missed the boat. I wonder how Effie feels about dating apps these days. Would she be on them? Well, she got married, but in the show I did after she got married, she married someone she loved that was part of her past, you know. But I think she was really upset that she didn't do the sex thing earlier because she realised how much fun it was. And she has a very um, curious bestie who's on the apps all the time and introduced her to Tinder. I think she was just browsing for a while. We've all been there, Yeah, let's be honest. (laughs) Was there ever a moment when Effie was being invited to everything in that period of time where Acropolis Now was huge. And, I mean, you've won Logies for this, like, incredible performance. But was there ever a moment where you were there 
as Effie and wondering like, how the hell did we get here? Like, or a moment where you just had to pinch yourself because you're like, holy Moses, look at where we're at. Yeah, totally. I mean, it wasn't in my plan. I didn't, you know, the boys I'm sure had a different plan to me. I thought I'd be doing community theatre for the rest of my life. I, I didn't think I'd be commercial. I'm so glad I am. And it's important that people like me and us are, you know, to represent you know, all the different flavours that are out there. But the boys had a plan, I'm sure. I'm sure they had Logies in their, you know, in their On their wish vision list. board, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> not me. I thought I'd be rolling around the floor, as you saw in the show, and doing community <laughs> theatre and, and getting paid, you know, basic minimum wage. But I was lucky enough to find people that wanted to do something bold and and that's what ultimately got us there. I think about that all the time, but I also know how hard I've worked and, you know, how devoted I am to putting things out there that I think are worthy. I, and I don't mean that in a really negative sense, but that people should waste their time and money to watch. When I put a show together, I give it everything. I question every aspect of it. It's expensive to be entertained, whether it's money or time that you're taking from someone. And I don't want to put anything less than what I think I'm capable of. And I want to question it right until the last minute. And the show that you saw, I've done a slight rewrite on, even though, you know, it got great reviews and the audience's responses couldn't have been better. I knew that there were bits in there that I could improve. You know, every show I do, I did two on Saturday. I wanted to better the one I did earlier that day at the matinee. So, you know, I think ambition is a good thing when it involves other people's, you know, efforts and and money and time. So I'm not surprised by the fact that it's lasted. What I was surprised is that it took off so quickly at the beginning, but I didn't want to uh, give up a character like Effie. And so I've stayed with her. Some would say maybe to the detriment of my career because I was capable of other things, but I also knew the gift that she was. And for me, it was more of a a race ticket that I wanted to play. You know, I wanted to keep it on the agenda. I wanted to keep playing characters that were talking about those issues, which I think are evergreen. I think race is not something that we've solved as a as an issue. I think that the more great material that is out there, the more it's on the table, the more we can say it's something that we're actively conscious of. And it, it doesn't go away. Those isms, racism, ageism, sexism, they don't go away. They're always there. And it's important to talk about them in a way people want to hear, you know. You haven't always played Effie for your entire career, but has there ever been a point where you have tried to leave Effie behind? No, this is the first time I've literally got her on the side as a resting piece of meat, luxuriating in her own juices. But <laughs> um, look, I've done legitimate acting roles. I, you know, I was in things like for the ABC, like Grassroots and Wild Side, and I've done shows at the STC, and and I love all of that. And that is adding to my toolbox because it forces me out of, you know, just leaning into the stuff that I know that I want to keep taking further down the line. It's refreshing for me, but I don't think it's my calling. I think what what I'm good at and what I'm best at is writing material that in some way hides the medicine that it contains and putting it out there in, in a way that impacts an audience. I think I'm really good at high drama or high comedy. I'm not good at anything where I've got to walk into a room and talk about another character go employ somebody else. I'm not good at the soap study things. Oh, I, I just saw Claire. and on neighbours. No, <laughs> uh, I just saw Claire and apparently, you know, her and Jack have busted up. I'm not good at that stuff. <laughs> I'm good at crying or laughing and doing that to my audience. That's yeah. about it. Or thinking as well. Which is good. <laughs> or as your dad said, telling your own stories, right? Totally. Where does Effie go from here? Because... You know, we've seen her grow and mature over the years and her life has changed. Does Effie have a plan to return to us on a TV screen, on a big screen, back on the stage? Where does Effie come back to us in the future? Well, you know, Effie, in the words of, you know, Zoolander, is still so hot right now. I mean, she's never <laughs> looked better, you know, and I mean, she's a lot more current even though she's got, 
you know, things that we recognise from her past, which is the large hair and... and so um, the hair remains. The yes. hair remains. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's like wears things from Zhivago and really cool brands that are out there. <laughs> and I suppose she's like a, a puffed up Kardashian, oh, you God. know, sort of... She's a, really the OG Kardashian, yeah, isn't she? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, one letter only, one E, not multiple E's. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm thinking now because I've been touring this Mary show and there's a television idea we're working on within the DNA of the Mary show that this is personal thing, which I think is super exciting and fresh and raw and all those things that I really like. So I'm currently putting that together and those ideas are flooding in in a way that you would hope. But... The other night after the show, this guy got up and well, I was at a dinner and uh, he'd just seen the show and he talked about how much the Mary show blew his, his mind, which is great. But then he said with a very sad look on his face, does does that mean Effie's not going to be around? And I'm like, no, 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 don't worry, Effie's coming back. She's never gone for long. So I, I want to write another Effie stage show because it's so much fun. It's rock and roll meets comedy. It's hilarious. It's half of it's improvised. So it's very scary. You don't know what's going to happen next. You get to know your audience every night. Half the show is different every night. I love doing Effie. I'll never give her up. But I was just thinking to myself, once I've written this television show, I really want to write another Effie show. It's good to change it up a bit for me, you know, just to to have a little bit of distance and to come back objectively and see what's next. So, yeah, that's definitely in my sights. I'll, I'll get onto that in the second half of the year. We can't wait for that. But do you think Acropolis now could ever work on modern TV, like now, if it was to come back and I know that that's not on the cards. But if it were to come back, do you think it could still work in the way that it did back? And there's been other iterations of shows that have kind of based themselves on what Acropolis Now was doing in a more modern setting. But do you think if, you know, you guys were to come back together and try and recreate that magic that we saw 30 years ago, could it work again now, you think? I think it would because uh, I don't think it's politically correct. And I think that we need more of that stuff out there. You know, I think that we need to be able to laugh at things that are uncomfortable. I think that the dynamic, the chemistry between all of us was fantastic. Do sitcoms really have a place currently? I think sometimes we get a bit fatigued at certain genres. You know, I think that it would be stylistically perhaps a little different, maybe not a sitcom. I think people are finding that stuff a little predictable now. I'm just trying to think what sitcoms are still really working. You know, in you know, in the recent past there there have been the Big Bang Theory and all of that. But I don't know whether it would be a sitcom. It was very emotional, it was very playful, it was very honest, the characters were really well defined. I think it has all the ingredients of something that would work. I'm not rushing to try recreate it. I think it it was something that happened then and I love that it still matters to people and it's still sort of relevant, but I I wouldn't rush to doing that again. There's just too many other things I want to do. Well, I'm glad to see that Effie lives on and also I'm imagining the makers of VO5 Hairspray are very, very grateful that she still exists. Uh, How many cans of hairspray does that woman go through? I know. It it is a commitment, but uh, (laughs) a lot. At least it looks not you know, dried up and and frizzy. And not a grey to be seen. Not a grey to be seen. Well, she was a former hairdresser, so she wouldn't. She wouldn't. She knows how to maintain. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's something that the halo of Effie, I suppose, the hair represented her internal love of self and the bigness of that. So you know, that's still big and proud. Well, Mary, thank you very much for sitting down and and sharing a bit of your life with us today. We really appreciate you being here and thank you for giving us Effie. She's been a gift to us all. Thank you. Well, you know, to all the women out there that are listening, I'm glad you guys are there. The amount of product you produce, all the different voices that you put out there, you know, it is just, it just shows you how much demand there is for, you know, all this great talent that people should have access to and all this great information you guys do it brilliantly so thank you for being a very popular outlet for me to do my thing but there's more to this conversation with mary kustis once we'd wrapped the recording that you just heard mary and i chatted for like another 25 minutes or so and luckily our producer emmeline did not stop recording because that's what good producers do they know when they might catch a little bit of juicy gold In part two of our conversation, Mary and I spoke really candidly about our very different experiences as the children of migrants. I always say to her, every trip, do you wish you didn't leave? 
She said, no, God, no, I'm glad I did. Mary told the incredible story of her mother's almost unbelievable journey from Greece to Australia. She thought someone from the airline would notify a distant relative to come and tell her that the plane had landed. So she waited at that airport for seven hours, crying the whole time, looking at every face, hoping to see a familiar one. And why she often sends her mum to the bathroom to spy at her live shows. She was my little mole, my little market research person. If you want to listen to that conversation, which Mary has given us permission to share, of course, there's a link in the show notes to listen right now. And if you can make it to her live show, this is personal, please do it. This will sound like such a cliche, but I legitimately laughed and cried. It is just so full of love and emotion. And she is just an amazing storyteller. We'll pop a link to grab tickets in the show notes. The producer of No Filter is the always knows when to not press stop on the record, Emmeline Peterson. Our executive producer is Eliza Ratliff with sound production by Madeline Joannou. And I'm Claire Murphy. Thanks for listening. <laughs>